Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Hope you're having a great day today. Well, today's video, we're gonna be addressing EV misinformation. That's right, electric vehicle misinformation. has been quite a bit out there. And I'm sure you've probably heard it, or maybe you've heard it and you didn't know it was misinformation. But uh, today I'm gonna be reacting to a video and it's from Car Coach Report. And you know what I believe is a lot of misinformation. So let's go ahead and get into this. <laughs> I'm back and now we're going to react to this video from news nation and they're interviewing lauren fix from the car coach report and let's go ahead and dive into this expert and the founder of the car coach reports lauren fix lauren welcome back thank you so we, yeah there's a lot going on yeah i think this is really serious i mean when you're telling you hey you have to drive an electric car and they're going to mandate 100 percent of sales in there's actually a total of 17 states that will, will jump on by 2030 and, and as of 2026, they're going to start making it that you, if you don't sell an electric car in the state, and I don't mean one, I mean 35 percent, you're not going to be allowed to sell vehicles in that state. So it is true that by a certain date, these states are going to require 100 percent electric vehicles, either plug-in hybrids or either fully electric vehicles. Let's proceed on. Then why is there a growing lag in sales when it comes to EVs? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One, the average cost of a gasoline-powered car is about $48,000. The average cost of any electric car is average. Now, I'm just do some more and less. It is $60,000. So it's a big variance. And on top of that, we've got uh, people still can't afford these vehicles because the insurance rates are higher and you need to have charging. Okay, let me address this here. Uh, she said that the average cost of a gas-powered car is 40000 and the average cost of an electric vehicle it's 60000 that's a $20,000 spread. And let's see what the actual data shows. According to the latest data from Kelly Blue Book, the average transaction price for an electric car was $55,544 in December versus a gas-powered vehicle at $49,740. The EV industry electric vehicle leader Tesla's average transaction price of $55,258, about flat from a month earlier. So there's a big difference from what she stated. She stated a $20,000 spread when in fact it is $5,800. So that's a pretty big difference. And as we've been going, getting further along with this electric vehicle adoption, the the price parity is getting smaller and smaller. And so, uh, yeah, just want to address that. And on top of that, we've got uh, people still can't afford these vehicles because the insurance rates are higher and you need to have charging. And only 60% of the country have garages to plug them in. So if you don't have a garage, you need... Uh, let me address the insurance part. Uh, I've done videos on this before, and it depends on what you, you're comparing a vehicle to. And a lot of these comparisons, they're comparing vehicles. Like I've seen them compare a Model X to a Toyota Corolla and... The Model X is an 80000 plus vehicle versus a $30,000 vehicle. And one's an SUV, the other one isn't. And so you just see the, the, when they, the comparisons are just usually all out of whack. However, when I compare my Rivian R1S to the Jeep Tricock, the Jeep Tricock was a lot more expensive to insure than the Rivian R1S. And in fact, my insurance just went down. And I did cover this in a later video, but it all depends on what you are comparing your electric vehicle to. If you need to go to public charging, you can't drop a cord and charge in New York City or Chicago from your 10-story apartment. That won't work. So you have to find a place to charge. And again, I'm going to pause again here. And what she's saying is actually, in fact, true that around 40% of people probably won't be able to charge at home because they live in apartments, have street side parking, or other situations that they, they may have an outdated electrical box where it may be financially prohibitive to upgrade that to get an EV charger uh, installed. However, there are some new technologies coming online uh, that can address that, but that is a true issue. However, one of the things in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there was allocated 7.5 billion and 2.5 billion that was to address urban charging infrastructure, like adding a bunch of level two chargers to, to parking garages, to apartments and things like that uh, to really help uh, ensure that the majority of people are able to charge at home or either at work. So that's been a problem on a global basis. Uh, the charging infrastructure is not there. They took billions of dollars and they only put up six charging stations. That's our tax dollars. This claim here is absolutely false. And she's referring to the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding. And basically the federal government allocated money to the states uh, to install chargers. So this money has been appropriated 
it goes to the states and the states have to 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 bid out these projects in order to get these stock these charges installed mm-hmm. there are more than eight but they're trying to make it seem as if that each one of these charges costs like a billion dollars that's completely false and i want to pause again here i want to show you this and have a look at this and right here news nation is actually showing the the difference in prices between electric vehicles and and, and gas powered vehicles which is nowhere near the numbers unless you rounded way up she rounded up on the electric vehicles about four thousand rounded down on the gas powered vehicles by nine thousand so news nation is actually providing more updated correct data than laura fix is providing and Lauren, talk about Biden's decision to allow California, along with those other states, to ban gas-powered vehicles in 11 years. That's not a lot of time. How good does impact sales moving forward? It's a huge impact. Uh, first off, I, I know the first thing that President Trump's going to do when he gets into office is remove that $7,500 tax credit, remove that mandate. That may have an impact on electric vehicles. We'll see. You know, if they do get rid of it, I think they should, personally, because I don't like the way it's structured. Um, a lot of people probably wouldn't qualify for it. A lot of vehicles don't qualify. Um, there are very few vehicles. If you go on the Department of Transportation website or the Department of Energy's website, you'll see that there are not a lot of vehicles that qualify for this. However, if you're leasing vehicles, you can qualify through a loophole, the leasing loophole. That is good. I, I think that they should keep. Um, and that we'll just have to wait and see how this is going to impact it. Most people don't even know these things exist. And so I'm not sure what the impact is really going to be. Just going to ask the average person, do they know anything about tax incentives for EVs? I'm willing to bet that nine out of 10 of them have no idea about any EV incentives. Well, sought after EVs are significantly more expensive than the traditional gas powered vehicles. Why are they so expensive and what will it take to bring pricing down? Is it simply more infrastructure when it comes to charging? Well, I, I think the, the cost, the average cost of the vehicle, the reason it's so high is all those materials are, that go to the battery are owned by Chinese mining companies. So you have to buy those from China. And if they had a tariff on top of it, it's going to be even more expensive. We don't mine those materials here in the U.S. or in North America because they're dangerous. You don't see cobalt mines because it causes cobalt long. It damages the environment around it. Again, let me stop here. Again, this is this is partly true. Uh, we don't mine cobalt here. We did just recently open a cobalt mine up and it was in Idaho, but it closed right before which we're going to open up. And the reason being is that the price of cobalt fell. When they originally planned to open a mine, cobalt was selling at $40. And by the time it came around to opening the cobalt mine up, the price had dropped down to $15, and which would have ended up costing them more money to extract it than they would have been able to profit off of it in the free market. And as far as uh, China is concerned, yes, they do own a lot of the supply chains. Um, not all of these materials come from China. In fact, lithium, China is number three. Uh, most of this lithium is actually in, in South America and in Australia. Chile is number one, and Australia is number two, and then China is number three. However, it depends on the, the battery. Uh, China owns a big, large supply of graphite. And the majority of the world graphite comes from China. And these batteries have graphite in them. They have manganese cobalt, which most of that comes from the Congo. However, the Chinese own a lot of the mining companies in the Congo. So no matter what, when it comes to these battery manufacturing, uh, you're probably going to go through China because they own the supply chains. So we don't do that. But in China, they do it. They do it in Afghanistan. I mean, there's a million places they're doing it around the world, but they're not here. Uh, South America also has mines. Africa has mines. And this is a problem. So the choice is. To- oh yeah, one more thing. Uh, the U.S. is also opening up lithium, a lithium mine. Uh, they already received a loan from the Department of Energy, and these mines are going to be in Nevada. And so the U.S. will be mining lithium uh, here shortly. You buy an electric car. Do you buy a hybrid? That's your choice. The the idea is that consumers can choose what they want. And now the one thing about that mandate going away is what's going to happen is manufacturers won't be making electric cars. They'll make a few. You'll find like Hyundai will make their Ionic line because it sells. But uh, General Motors will probably make the Chevy Bolt line, you know, some of the more reasonably priced cars because that. And I agree here. Uh, I believe she's correct. I believe that these the big three auto manufacturers are going to pull back on electric vehicle manufacturers. I predicted that a couple of years ago. They're just waiting out to a new administration. So they go, go ahead back and making those big old trucks and SUVs. 
and that's what they plan on doing. General Motors won't get too far behind because they already seen what's going to happen just based on their, their experience in China. And I also believe how they care group, they're serious. Uh, I believe they're going to hold back. They may slow down a little bit, but a lot of their vehicles didn't qualify anyway, uh, just until recently. And so that shouldn't have a, too big of an impact on them. And so we just have to see what happens. I, I still believe that this year is going to be a record year for EV sales. Let's go ahead and proceed on. Those do sell. But when you're looking at the more expensive cars that get really crazy expensive, manufacturers can't afford to make these and consumers can't afford to buy them. And I highly suggest you lease one anyhow, because in three years after your lease is up, they're outdated. Right. And usually the battery is worn down. What is the future of the EV? It's actually total of 17. Okay. Okay. Let me go back and see what she said. That's pretty funny. And I highly suggest you lease one anyhow, because in three years after your lease is up, they're outdated. Right. And usually the battery is worn down. What do you see the future of the EV? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just let you hear that again. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> let me address a few points here. I agree with the leasing part of it because right now with the leasing loophole, you can get $7,500 off the, the price of the, the vehicle, which will lower your lease rate. You can get a great deal on the lease. Um, and, and I did that myself with, uh, with one of my Rivians. But um, so I agree 100% right there. However, I have to disagree when it comes to these vehicles being outdated in three years. I have my Rivian on one T for two years now, and I have to say that my vehicle is just as new as it was the day I purchased it. And I cannot say that about any internal combustion vehicle I've ever owned before, because every month or so, my vehicle is getting a new update. They're adding new features. They're pre-proving a vehicle experience. And so my vehicle is better now than it was the day I purchased it. And so that is patently false and it's going to depend on the manufacturer. Would that be true with GM, Ford, or, or uh, Stellantis or Hyundai Kia? Probably. Uh, however, it's no more true than an internal combustion engine vehicle because once you buy that vehicle, that day you have it, usually the features don't change. Whatever you, you bought on a vehicle is what's going to have the life of the vehicle. Unlike a Rivian or a Tesla or a Lucid, you might get updates every month. So every day, every month, your vehicle is being updated. And so three years down the road, you have the same stuff on your vehicle as a purchase person that's purchasing their vehicle today. So that is incorrect. And also at the address, the battery is uh, going to be dead. Let, let me uh, take you to the study. Uh, this is I hear this misinformation all the time. So I just want to show you this article from Sanford Report. And it said, and this is as of December 9, 2024. So it's pretty recent. And it says, existing EV batteries may last up to 40% longer than expected. Consumers' real-world stop and go driving of electric vehicles benefit batteries more than the steady use simulated in the most all laboratory tests of new battery designs, Stanford SLAC study finds. So there's a lot of misinformation about the batteries, and the batteries are expected to last anywhere from, from 10 to 20 years. The same amount of time you're going to get out of the internal bus combustion engine vehicle, it'll, transmission or engine more likely even longer and so these the, the bat even a battery degradation is a lot lower than a lot of people were predicting very low there's it happens more so on the front end and then as the battery ages the degradation is lower and lower in addition to that all of these vehicles have to have at least an eight-year 100,000 mile battery warranty which also include the motors so if you get an electric vehicle that's three years old you still have five years worth of warranty on where do you see the future of the EV market five to 10 years down the line, Lauren, especially when we talk about competition? Do you think Tesla will continue to dominate? Dominate. Tesla will absolutely continue to dominate. Currently, they own about 66% of the market share. And if the mandate goes away as well as the tax credit, the only one that succeeds out of that one is probably Rivian, Lucid, and Tesla, of course. Okay. Uh, she just, did she say 66%? She said 66%. Maybe two years ago, three years ago. As of today, Tesla owns about 48% of the market share. So I'm not sure where she got that 66% number from. Even on the global scale, there's like 13%. So, um, and that that number has been going down by large, large amounts every year. And it's just going to continue to go down. There's more EV makers. There's more car makers start to produce EVs. People like choice. Not everyone's going to like a Tesla. I didn't buy a Tesla. Uh, because it didn't, I didn't like the interior of it. And that's why I decided to wait to find the vehicle that I like, which is why I ended up getting a Rivian on one T. My sister just purchased a vehicle. She waited until she got one that she liked. And people just like different types of vehicles. Honda people like Honda vehicles. Toyota people like Toyotas. 
And so once these companies start producing electric vehicles, these people who are brand loyal are more likely are going to purchase a vehicle from the brand that they're used to. And we've seen that with the Honda Pro Prologue. Even though it's a GM vehicle, the sales went through the roof. They had a lot of sales of that vehicle, even though it's produced by GM, because people are used to the Honda brand and they decided to buy a Honda vehicle. And on a global basis, Tesla is still leading the path. Uh, in Europe, they are actually losing the crown with the Model Y. There's a new gasoline-powered vehicle called a Dacia that is a, a partly Romanian and partly French that is uh, taking over the marketplace. So will outsell Tesla for the first time in years. Uh, let me address this here. Yes, Tesla didn't wasn't the number one vehicle in, in Europe, but this is kind of a silly comparison, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, yeah, the, the vehicles she's compared it to is, let me show you this vehicle. This is a vehicle here that uh, she is comparing the Tesla to, and this is a $13,000 vehicle. Yes, right, I said $13,000. So, uh, and she is comparing this to a $45,000 Model Y, which is a top selling vehicle, yes. And so if you're looking at prices, you know, the $13,000 vehicle versus a $45,000 vehicle. And plus uh, the $45,000 vehicle is an electric vehicle. And so one should expect that a $13,000 car should outsell a $45,000 electric vehicle. And so I, I don't think that's really a fair comparison to compare those two vehicles. So let me know what you think in the comment section about the points that she made. Do you agree or disagree? And what do you think about the points that I made, the counterpoints that I made to the points that she was making? Again, I'm not sure what her motivations are. Her husband is a race car driver named Paul Fix, and they do all Fix Motorsports. And at one point, one of their big sponsors was uh, Coke Industries, a you know big oil company. Uh, but that is no longer the case, at least not for Fix Sports. When I looked at, the, at their sponsorships, I didn't see that they were sponsored by uh, them anymore. But however, I do not know who the sponsors are for Car Coach Reports. But if you do, let me know in the comment section, because I'm always wondering what the mo underlying motivations are, especially when you have... When you're putting out misinformation on this level, uh, in my opinion, this is kind of too far over the top. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. But that's all I have for today. I'd like to thank you for joining me once again. And I can't wait to see you on the next video.